Uh, we've always said, who grew your food? We want you to know where your food's coming from. Today, we had the honor, uh, the privilege of sitting down with Andy and Kendall from Three Creeks. Uh, they're in Groveport, Ohio, which is just south of Columbus. They have five acres, and it sounds like by the conversation today, they're expanding even down the road a little bit to a little bit more land, um, growing more food. And uh, throughout the years, we've gotten to know them, and we caught a little bit of it today. Uh, can't wait for you to listen. Can't wait for you to hear what they had to say. We want you to know these folks. We want you to see their faces. We want you to hear their stories. And they did an awesome job today at giving us a visual of what they go through, of what they have to do day in and day out. And that's what it's all about. That's who we're giving our money to. That's who we're voting yes for as we eat, as we pay attention to who grew our food. So my biggest question, of course, to you guys, as you know, just as uh, friends, um, it just catch me up. What happened over the winter? Have you guys recouped it all? Are you uh, ready to go at it again? Or are you, screw it, I hate small farming. I would say um, since 2020, when we started farming year round um, with our high tunnels, mm -hmm. and it's not, we don't have as much of a recovery time right. in the winter uh, as we used to. So it is kind of like a, a maintain, we reduce our, our customers and we reduce our crops quite a bit. We reduce our staff quite a bit, um, but there is still daily activity. So yeah, not as much of a recovery, but, um, but yeah, it changes pace quite a bit. So yeah. we've been doing a lot of planning for the year ahead, which mm -hmm. is going to be exciting. I think did a little um, retreat about a month ago yeah. to Ann Arbor for a weekend, just to have some dedicated time to think through things uh -huh. and make some decisions. Yeah, lots of spreadsheeting, uh -huh. sitting in an Airbnb in an Arbor, doing a bunch yeah. of spreadsheets, but uninterrupted though. It yeah. feels different when you're spreadsheeting at an Airbnb. Yeah. 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 yeah That's at, awesome. At home, there are always chores and things that we're mm -hmm. attending to. So nice to, nice to get away for yeah. a little bit of time. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, Sarah and I, my wife and I went out um, to the Mohican tree houses mm -hmm. and we were sitting, of course, it's 25 minutes from here. It's the same land that our house is on. And I was so relaxed and I'm like, what? Like I've literally tried to build this that I could live at, you know, our, on our little whatever. And I'm like, oh, you're never going to feel like this at your own home. No. You're always going to have a million things to do. Yeah. You have to literally go to your own home 20 minutes away, you know, to feel like you're on vacation. Um, so you're planning. I know you're here today to talk to Chase specifically about planning, but how does it, how, I mean, at what stage are you at? Like, you know, you kind of started with a dream. You start in one plot of your five acres, you expand, you get another hoop, you do whatever you're going to do, rotational crops, you get cover crops, all that kind of stuff. Like what stage are you at? And like, is it like we're at full production? This is what this piece can do. Or is it like, man, we're halfway to, phase seven or whatever that is. What's that look like for you? Yeah, we're actually at a pretty exciting phase. I think uh, when you last were at our farm, um, you and Sarah, we had, we were using probably about half the property, I'd say. Yeah, that seems right. Um, and, and at that point, Andy was considering leaving his full-time job, but hadn't yet, I think. Okay. So in 2020, he did that. And then I get to leave my full-time job in March. Really? So it's a pretty exciting pretty exciting time yeah I would think it's going to support both of us and then our we have you know several full-time staff members as well so it feels really good um That's yeah incredible. as far as the land base goes yeah. we've grown on the our entire property the last two years mm -hmm. um still you know figuring it out but have utilized all of the land that we have available uh and then we are in the process of leasing a piece just down the road that's another maybe an acre and a half of growing space. Uh, we probably won't utilize all of that this year, but yeah. kind of gives us a little room to spread into, so. Wow. Yeah, and you'll remember from being on our farm, we are kind of landlocked. There's, yeah. we're in a suburban area surrounded kind of by in, uh, warehouses and commercial You're right. um, light industry. So we have to kind of look at those smaller plots. Um, we don't have a lot of big, big fields yeah. to, to rent or expand into. Right. So. 
Right, yeah, it's super interesting because it feels like if you've not been to your place before, even when you pull in the driveway, you're like, I don't know if this is the right place. Yeah. And then you see the back, you get to the back. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I would not, I don't want to over romanticize everything like I do, but it's almost like when you look at like models that, that anyone would say, well, well, okay, for the next 10 years or 30 years, what's even possible for small food growers? Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like there's so many times I think it isn't possible almost in the model that we're in. But then I look at you guys and I'm like, you guys planned meticulously to expand, uh, com not comfortably. You, you didn't, um, you didn't just dive all in. You didn't just both quit your jobs and go and say, listen, we've got to make this work next year. I mean, it feel, do you, I don't know anyone else that's done it. Like you guys have done it. Do you have other peers that are do it like that? Or, or, it feels like you guys like kind of set like a model where I think the country should be looking at people like you and going, Hey, young inspired people that want to grow food. This is, you can do it, mm -hmm. but man, it takes a lot of what planning patience. Villain, yeah, patience. Yeah. Yeah. Patience and yeah. Planning. Yeah. And I think everybody kind of has their own journey. You know, everybody starts out at a different spot. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the advantages and disadvantages that we had and, mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we got lucky a number of times along the way and some of the planning <laughs> paid off and, you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think we talk to other folks that are, that are trying to make it work and to varying levels of success because yeah. of, you know, the circumstances that they're in. And yeah, right, right. I, it, it's, um, it's super inspiring. It's like, um, you want, I want it to be, I want there to be hope for our, for our future of food. Um, I want it, I want there to be hope for that. There is enough customers that will indeed pay for this type of food. I've been in it now a decade and there's part of me that's like, man, that was just a young kid that thought the world was going to change. And I don't know that it will, but then you know, every day there's like a story or there's like a customer or there's a grower or there's a whatever. And it's like, man, I almost look at you and have hope like, oh, yeah, no, it, we can do this. I mean, do you guys feel like that or do you just or is it just like like as you circle back to another year, you're just like, well, we'll try it one more time. Yeah, I guess we feel good about our operation and do think that there are that there are there's more room for people like us. And sometimes um, we look around and think like, why, why aren't? there are more people mm -hmm. doing it in sort of this way on this scale, I guess I'll say. Yeah. Um, and I, and I don't know, like, I, I do think that there's more room for it, but it's very scary mm. to, to make the full dive in, um, without having like commercial success, like something to count on mm -hmm. someone, someone to sell the food to. And mm -hmm. I think it's the, the model for, for produce sales there there's limited options out there for people. So they think, okay, well, I'm going to do the farmer's market because that's, that's the model. That's what we do. That's the fun thing. That's what everyone seems to do. Yep. Um, and there are some risks to, to that. There's some oversaturation there's, you know, so then I think if people try it and it doesn't go well, they think, okay, well, this must not be something that yeah. work. Um, but I think with a little more creativity, um, and then good relationships that you can leverage with, with things like yellow bird or like restaurant chains, um, mm -hmm. look beyond the, look beyond the chefy stuff, which we love, but sure. look beyond the chefy stuff and look beyond the farmer's market. I think there's a lot of room yeah. for sales, yeah. there, sales opportunities. There. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you say that because I started, you guys know this, I had a hoop house mm -hmm. and I was growing it, you know, a hoop house full of food and I didn't know a thing about a thing. And so I went to the farmer's markets and I went to the chefs This is in Finley, Ohio, where I'm from. And there was nothing there. I mean, it wasn't nothing, but it was not profitable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I would looked around and I started asking the other growers, what am I doing wrong? And they're like, nothing, this is it. And I'm like, that's when I got scared. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's no way this to me, this is the top shelf food that, that, that would eradicate so many health problems. It would solve uh, local economies in rural places, all these different check boxes. And if mm -hmm. we can't, make this work 
I, I don't know. I don't, I've lost hope for a lot of things maybe. And so that was when it was like, well, for me, it was, I've got to create a model by which if anyone's growing food this way, and I wasn't, I mean, I was okay at it. I wasn't amazing at it that, that somebody could sell into that. We could create enough of a sales demand that, that, small growers could grow and then sell into that and feel confident then planning and growing. And not that it would be, you know, obviously it's not like everything you grow, we buy, but you have diversified enough that you kind of blend your blend. You know, you've got tiny little, I'm sure chefs that just, you know, you've known forever that you service all the way up to food service contracts or whatever, food banks, whatever it might be, yellow bird type stuff. And I'm kind of guessing like, no, you're right. Yeah. And, then, and you've been able to make that work by blending, by adapting, by diversifying, changing in the moment. Mm -hmm. And at some level, at some point you started hiring, like, oh, man, we're not, it's not just the two of us, we're providing jobs. Mm -hmm. And, and that's weird because it's seasonal and who can work seasonally? You know, I, you know, all those different things that I know happen. Um, it's just incredible. I, I just continue to be in awe of it. I, I do, um, um, want to ask you about, um, have you, well, two, a two parter. Number one, um, what do you see as the bottlenecks? Uh, maybe not even for you personally, but just like, like I always say butchers, there's not enough butchers right. and you know, because you can't get a date if somebody's, you know, you can't get a date to get your animals slaughtered until next year, sometime 2025. And it's like, well, that's only because there's not enough butchers. If there was, you'd be able to get a date in June and you'd be able to take whatever it is. Anyways, what do you guys see? What are, where's the bottlenecks at in the, in the food system for small growers? And the second part is, is there, maybe there isn't yet, but it, do you see a solution or have you thought of things where it's like, well, if we had this, yeah. I don't know what it might be. Even though we don't do livestock, I would second the, the butcher processing uh -huh. abattoir situation yeah um it's just a pinch point in in a lot of regions not just here yeah and i think that's also a reason why so many otherwise qualifying livestock producers that would that would choose to be certified organic can't be certified organic mm. because the processor is part of that chain and the processor has to also be able to handle certified product right and that's a niche within a niche yes that's, so that's it's a bottleneck within yeah. a bottleneck yeah yeah i think that 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 middle processor piece though is also largely moving from the vegetables. I mean, there there's so much, we have capacity to grow things that could be canned or frozen mm. or any number of things, mm. which would help extend our season of income and uh, an eater's uh, season of eating local food um, where, you know, we, uh, like to think that at some point we'd be able to do that, but mm -hmm. you know, fi finding space and capital to mm -hmm. do that is challenging. Um, so like, uh, are you talking about like a brinery type group that would be like, well, we're going to make krauts and that kind of thing, right. or what is or it? Or even like, uh, you know, the, the thing we always think about is, um, you know, like canned tomatoes. Okay. You know, how, how, how many times a week are people pulling a can of tomatoes out right. of their pantry? Right. And there's, there's absolutely no reason that those all can't be grown here it's not having the capacity to bring them together. And if, and if we did, chances are it would be contracted with a, you know, one central grower, two or three large growers, instead of a bunch of small growers that have room to put in a couple of beds and could bring those things to the yes. facility at a time. Or things like, you know, frozen peas, frozen broccoli, things yes. that maybe have a narrow, a narrow window of availability here and could be frozen at their highest quality and distributed locally. Uh, but instead, we're still eating those things in the winter. We're just eating them from right. someplace else. Right, right, yes, exactly. Um, I talked to um, sometimes uh, a friend of mine who grows mushrooms, and he talks about Pennsylvania being kind of the, America's really only hotbed of mushroom production. And the rest of the mushrooms, anything that's in any of the nutraceuticals that you're seeing, any of the mud water type stuff that you're seeing is all imported from China. And he's like, there's no reason that America couldn't grow at least any that would contribute to that, but we get, but we get it all from overseas. And I think about that because what you're saying with the tomatoes is like, you think of the two or three labels that own that market on the, in the grocery store. And 
they're in every restaurant in the classic number five can or whatever, you know, that, mm-hmm. that tin can almost looking thing. And it's like, right, how do you build the facility and then logistically coordinate with the small growers to be able to get enough to make any quantity at all? And then from there, then how, you know, it's like there's all these different moving pieces to it, but yeah, it's not or impossible. Just, or just like co-packing something for us with our branding on it. Uh-huh. Like there's, there's legal requirements. I mean, there's some cottage laws that we could probably work within, but there uh-huh. are legal requirements that prevent us from processing food down to just cutting it up. So, you know, just the ability to have a, a place to take it to or work with that could contract with us to, yes. to put something together, sold through something like Yellow Bird or sold through a yeah, farm stand. Right. We were up in Michigan um, for that a retreat, a retreat we mentioned and yep. noticed like, of course we visited the little, um, the, they have some fun uh, local grocery stores up there that work with small growers. Um, and there was more frozen stuff from local farms in there. And we're like, huh, I wonder if Michigan has maybe like a facility or two. Right. Cause we're seeing similar packaging, but different farm right. names. Well, on, what on was things. the packaging? What did it look like? Oh, it wasn't. Clamshells? No, like kind of like frozen stuff, like uh, the product over there. Yeah. Um, just like vacuum yeah, pack label on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, like just a sealed plastic bag like you'd see in the grocery store with, with stuff from yes. California or Washington yes. or you know, where, yeah. wherever it's coming out of. Right. That feels to me like a solvable problem. And let me ask you this last question. Um, well, actually, I have, a diff- I have a different last question. Second to last question. Um, do you, in the next five years, let's say, here's what I foresee, or here's what I think that I'm sniffing. Mm-hmm. The USDA, to some degree, is kind of waking up to the what's happened over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. Some of it from their own doing, much of it from their own doing. They don't know how to make it right. Yeah. They're throwing money at things that maybe isn't even the right things. But my hope is that eventually the right person gets to the right place and talks to the right person. That's like, no, this is actually what is needed. And then there's assistance given for a program like that, where it would be like even an academic institution that would take, I mean, we're right by Kenyon and Mm -hmm. you know, they do a great job of doing farm to table or a decent job in their own cafeteria because they take it into their own hands. Well, what if there was, I mean, they have a farm, it's called the Kenyon farm and it's, you know, tw- run by 20 students or whatever. And they've got a farm manager and they've, you know, they produce for their cafeteria. What if a group like that got it, you know, a, a fart in their skillet that they were going to go, that was going to be their thing. And they got a grant for it and they built it and they, ha- you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that could happen. Mm-hmm. I don't know who would do it, but I, that's the kind of thing where I'm like, man, if, if it keeps going the way it's going, there might be an opportunity for that. That's my hope because yeah. then we can all participate together. Cause I know I can sell it. I know I can sell the product. Sure. I know you guys can make the product. It's like that bottleneck there in the middle. I, yeah. I mean, do you, is there anything like that that you see or you're, or, or um, you're hopeful for? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're right that it's, it's a very doable project. I mean, the, the, it's not a small investment, but it's not out of the question. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe getting that jump start funding and finding the right person mm-hmm. um, that gets it to the point where it can be sustainable on its own, I think yes. is the trick. And, yes, you know, yes. I think there is a market for it. It's just making sure that by time that initial blast of funding that maybe helps get it up on its feet is, is gone, that there's, uh, the markets are in place yep. then to sustain it. Yep. I think... Yes, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned in the last five years is looking at projects like that. And I think the key is, somebody explained it to me like this, whoever's giving the money, it could be the USDA, it could be anything, they wanna see that when their money runs out with what they've awarded, that you're gonna have the both the team, the vision, and the finances to finish that project that you thought you could do in that budget, but you can't. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to come to an end. Can you then finish it on your own as a business or as a nonprofit or whatever it might be? Right. And that's, yeah, I, 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 I'm interested in that. I'm interested in people who are talking about things like that. Um, okay. Final question. And then you guys can actually talk, um, what you're going to grow this year, which would be also awesome to have one, uh, recorded so that we can look back because you guys have done a great job you've done the fennel thing with us in the past where you did seed to, i still see those pictures every year when i go through and i'm like oh that was a really good project 
Um, if you, it could be a luxury item or a, no, this is an absolute necessity and it's, you know, anywhere from a grand to a hundred grand is like, man, we need this. Is there something? There's a lot of some things. Uh. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the other way to say it is this, as you look at your next five years, yeah. What do you picture in your mind that's that's there that isn't currently there? Where are you going to go and how you, I mean, what is that thing that you're going to do? We need lots of uh, poured concrete. Really? <laughs> What's that do? Uh, we are very, very um, overgrown for our kind of handling areas. Oh, For right. washing and handling. Right. So Pack we've been, houses. We've been trying to make do with little things here and there, the gravel on the ground, and but we are processing, we're growing so much food and processing, washing so much food that the amount of water we're handling and, and the amount of, we're handling pallets of stuff. Yes. But we're having to carry all of our boxes down a flight of stairs. Right, so, right. And then when the when the yellow bird truck pulls up or, you know, the um, food bank truck pull, pulls up, you know, we're having to then, everyone stop what they're doing yes. and carry the boxes yes. out instead of like, being able to pull up to something, we can use a, a pallet jack to move something. Yes. So just things like that, poured concrete, like a cooler that will allow a pallet to go in, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a beautiful <laughs> visualization. I know, it, I know it's nerdy because it's like, well, who wants to visualize pallets moving in and out? Mm. Yeah. That's the piece though, that when I wake up at three in the morning and I'm like, how do you describe to the customer what it's really like for the grower? That's the thing you can't describe because nobody thinks about things like that, including even myself. Like when you're, it's one thing to think about how much square footage growing food takes up. Yeah. That's not all that you do by a mile. That may be a minority of the time spent when you weigh it against how much you pack, move, touch. Every time you touch that food, it's more time, it's more margin you're losing because yeah. you gotta touch it one more time to get it onto the thing. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Go we're ahead. moving stuff from place to place pretty much all the time, whether it's seed, fertilizer, right. uh, soil, um, or the produce itself. I mean, there's just a lot of people and machines moving stuff from place to place. And we, you know, we've made investments strategically to improve those, but not able to do it all at once. Yeah. So and just, you need yeah. more poured concrete. <laughs> Would you have answered that question differently? No, I think I think the the packing areas yeah. are kind of the next. I mean, we've already begun improving those yeah. areas, but those are continued investments over the next couple of years, and then building uh, a bigger inside space, whether it's a barn or mm -hmm. a, a hoop structure. Uh, just to, to put equipment and st yep. storage generally. Yep. That would have been my guess. Yeah, things are getting squirreled away in different places. Yes. You know, the, the greenhouse over the winter gets filled with stuff, but then we need it in March and need to pull everything yep. back out. And, you know, so yes. doing something like that yes. is, you know, in the near future. Poured concrete. Remember the last time I, at the very end, you said there's actually no creeks at Three Creeks. Uh -huh. And I ended up titling the podcast that, No Creeks at Three Creeks. This one's poured concrete, which is just that you, it's just so simple, but you don't even think about it yeah. because it's like, well, yeah, like, you know, I'm not picturing you picking, packing, washing, storing, moving, loading up trucks and everybody on the farm. Like, listen, the truck is here. We got to put all this stuff on here. That is the most important thing for the next hour or 30 minutes or whatever it is. Right. And then everybody's got to go back and go do the thing that they were doing. Right. We do that here. I tell people all the time, when we got people packing in on the line, every one of those people have an actual full-time job. But for the 20 or, you know, the day that we pack, that's their job that day. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to hire for that, you know, yeah. but yeah. Well, um, as always, I appreciate you guys. And, and uh, man, I don't know how long we've known each other, five or six years or worked together for that long. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's a blessing to get to watch you guys grow the way that you grow and do what you do. I mean, ultimately, everything that I ever dreamed of was hopefully to be able to benefit folks like you and and make it a part of what you're doing. And when you start it, you don't even know. Like, I don't even know if it's possible. I'm gonna try, but I, but who knows? And so I hope that we just can be, I mean, we're just an asset in any way that we can be. Of course, I want you to you know always reach out and let us know, but. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we 
kind of the way we set out. I mean, we, we've got all of our ideals and everything, and we, we, we bake those into the farm as much as we can. But the, I think what we really wanted to do was, okay, let's grow as much, you know, certified organic food mm -hmm. close to the city as we can and displace the food that's coming from somewhere else yes. using different production practices. Yes. And so any, any place, anytime we can have a truck show up from someplace like Yellowbird yeah. and, you know, cart away a truckload of things mm. that we could grow. It just, it know, means it, we're doing it. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right. All right. I love it. Well, you guys can get after it. Um, thanks for coming again and, Thank you. and uh, Thank you. we'll do it next year at the same time. Great.